we present Michael Redgrave as P.G. Woodhouse in Performing Flea, compiled by Sam Pollock. During his long literary career, Woodhouse provided the plots, usually with Guy Bolton, and occasionally the lyrics for many of the most successful musicals of their day. The composers included Jerome Kern, George Gershwin, and Cole Porter. And theirs is the music in early recordings which accompanies this self-portrait of the great English humorist who died at the age of 93 in 1975. The narrator is Martin Jarvis. It is, of course, summer. In the world of P.G. Woodhouse, it could scarcely be any other season. We find him hard at work, tapping away at his favourite old 1927 Royal typewriter. A dedicated believer in the maxim of early to bed and early to rise, the Empress always turned in at about this time. Only by getting its regular eight hours can a pig keep up to the mark and preserve that schoolgirl complexion. Deprived of her society, which he had been enjoying since shortly after lunch, Clarence, ninth Earl of Emsworth, the seigneur of this favoured realm, pottered dreamily back to the house, pottered dreamily to the great library which was one of its features, and had just pottered dreamily to his favourite chair when Beach, his butler, entered bearing a laden tray. He gave it the vague stare which had so often incurred the censure. Oh, for goodness sake, Clarence, don't stand there looking like a goldfish. Of his sisters, Constance, Dora, Charlotte, Julia, and Hermione. Eh, he said. What? he added. Your dinner, my lord. Lord Emsworth's face cleared. He was telling himself that he might have known that there would be some simple explanation for that tray. Trust Beach to have everything under control. That stuff smells good, Beach. What is it? Leg of lamb, my lord, with boiled potatoes. And, Beach added, for he was a man who liked to be scrupulously accurate, spinach. Capital, capital. And to follow? Roly-poly pudding, my lord. Excellent. With plenty of jam, I hope. Yes, my lord. He has on his glasses. His pipe is firmly clenched between his teeth. Behind him, in front of the window, is a small table with a vase of flowers. Beyond the open window is the garden. A dog lies asleep on the lawn. The year... Well, it could be any one of the 23 Woodhouse lived here at Remsenburg, Long Island, an hour's drive from the skyscrapers of Manhattan. But there's something else on his mind, besides Blandings. This chap Winkler, J.P. Winkler to be exact, has sent me a long and detailed questionnaire about my way of life, past and present, and my opinions and reflections on practically everything under the sun. I am relieved, J.P., that you do not insist on my contributions being exclusively autobiographical, for as an autobiographer I am rather badly handicapped. On several occasions it has been suggested to me that I might take a pop at writing my reminiscences. Yours has been a long life, people say. You look about a hundred and four. You should make a book of it and cash in. It's a thought, of course, but I don't see how I could do it. The three essentials for an autobiography are that its compiler should have had an eccentric father, a miserable misunderstood childhood, and a hell of a time at his public school, and I enjoyed none of these advantages. My father was as normal as rice pudding. My childhood went like a breeze from start to finish, with everybody I met understanding me perfectly. While as for my school days at Dulwich, 
They were just six years of unbroken bliss. It would be laughable for me to attempt a formal autobiography. I have not got the material. Another thing about an autobiography is that to attract the cash customers, it must be full of good stories about the famous. And I can never think of any. If it were just a matter of dropping names, I could do that with the best of them. But can you really make a book with stuff like, I had long wished to make the acquaintance of Mr. Later Lord Attlee, but it was not for some years that I was enabled to gratify this ambition. A friend took me to the House of Commons, and we were enjoying tea on the terrace when Mr. Attlee came by. Oh, Clem, said my friend, I want you to meet Mr. Woodhouse. How do you do, said Mr. Attlee. How do you do, I replied. You can't charge people fifty bob or whatever it is for that sort of thing. But, J.P., if you insist, it would be better, I think, if I skipped childhood and adolescence and went straight to the autumn of 1900, when, a comely youth of some eighteen summers, I accepted employment in the Lombard Street office of the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. If there was a moment in the course of my banking career when I had the foggiest notion of what it was all about, I am unable to recall it. From the postal department, where I had nothing to do but stamp and post letters, a task for which my abilities well fitted me, I drifted to fixed deposits, and from fixed deposits to inward bills. No use asking me what inward bills are, I never found out. And then to outward bills and cash, always with a weak, apologetic smile on my face, and hoping that suavity of manner would see me through, when, as I knew must happen ere long, I fell short in the performance of my mystic duties. My total inability to grasp what was going on made me something of a legend in the place, Years afterwards, when the ineptness of a new clerk was under discussion in the manager's inner sanctum, and the disposition of those present at the conference was to condemn him as the worst bungler who had ever entered the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank's portals, some white-haired veteran in charge of one of the departments would shake his head and murmur, No, no, you're wrong. Young Robinson is, I agree, in almost total loss and ought to have been chloroformed at birth. But you should have seen P.G. Woodhouse. Ah, oh, they don't make them like that nowadays. They've lost the pattern. Two years I continued to pass my days in Lombard Street and to write at night in my bed sitting room. And a testing experience it was, for all I got out of it was a collection of rejection slips with which I could have papered the walls of a good-sized banqueting hall. Then someone started a magazine for boys called The Public School Magazine. And on top of that came another called The Captain and I had a market for the only sort of work I could do reasonably well, articles and short stories about school life. With these, and an occasional guinea from titbits and answers, I was becoming something of a capitalist, so much so that I had thoughts of resigning from the bank, and then one day the thing was taken out of my hands, and the decision made for me. Let me tell you the story of the new ledger. One of the things that sour authors, as every author knows, is being asked by people to write something clever in the front pages of their books. 
When I write a book, the golden words come pouring out like syrup. But let a smiling woman steal up to me with my latest and ask me to dash off something clever on the front page, and it is as though some hidden hand had removed my brain and substituted for it an order of cauliflower. The only time I ever wrote anything really clever on the front page of a book was when I was in the cash department at the bank and a new ledger came in and was placed in my charge. It had a white, gleaming front page. And suddenly there flitted into my mind like drifting thistledown the idea of writing on it a richly comic description of the celebrations and rejoicings marking the formal opening of the new ledger, and I immediately proceeded to do so. It was a most terrific piece. It had everything, including a bit about me being presented to His Gracious Majesty the King, which would have had you gasping with mirth. The whole thing was a knockout. I sat back on my stool and felt like Dickens when he had finished Pickwick. I was all in a glow. Then came the reaction. I got cold feet and started to turn stones and explore avenues. In the end, I decided that the best thing to do was to cut the page out with a sharp knife. A few mornings later, the stillness of the bank was shattered by a sudden yell of triumph, not unlike the cry of the Brazilian wild cat leaping on its prey. It was the head cashier discovering the absence of the page, and the reason he yelled triumphantly was that he was feuding with the stationers, and for weeks had been trying to get the goods on them in some way. He was at the telephone in two strides, asking them if they called themselves stationers, I suppose they replied that they did, for he then touched off his bombshell, accusing them of having delivered an imperfect ledger, a ledger with the front page missing. This brought the head stationer around in person, calling heaven to witness that when the book left his hands it had been all that a ledger should be, if not more so. Somebody must have cut out the page, he said. Absurd, said the head cashier. Nobody but an imbecile would cut out the front page of a ledger. Then, said the stationer, coming right back at him, you must have an imbecile in your department, have you? The head cashier started. Why, yes, he admitted, for he was a fair-minded man. There is P.G. Woodhouse. Weak in the head, is he, this Woodhouse? Very, so I've always thought. Then send for him and question him narrowly, said the stationer. This was done. They got me under the lights and grilled me, and I had to come clean. It was immediately after this that I found myself at liberty to embark on the life literary. <laughs> A lot of water has flowed under London Bridge, not all that far from the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, in the three score and more years that have passed since the bank dispensed with my services. In that time I've been round the world several times, stopping off at Hollywood and other spots in between, but since June 1952 Ethel and I have been living here in Remsenburg, Long Island, where the spacious windows of my workroom look out over the great South Bay. Apart from the attractive waterfront, we enjoy a number of other amenities, like fresh eggs and fresh air. But we have not progressed on the path of civilization so far as to have postmen. I walk two miles to the post office every day to get the afternoon mail, 
accompanied by Puna, the cat, and Bill, the foxhound, who generally packs up after the first furlong or so. Someone tells me that this is always the way with foxhounds. They have to do so much bustling about in their younger days that when of riper years their inclination is to say, Ah, oh, the hell with it, and just lie around in the sun. But Puna and I are made of sterner stuff, and we trudge the two miles there and the two miles back, singing a gypsy song. This keeps me in rare fettle. But let me tell you about Bill and Puna. I think the word must have gone round the animal kingdom that if you want a home, just drop in at Basket Neck Lane where the woodhouses keep open house. We acquired Bill the foxhound while I was away for some days in New York. One day my wife looked round, and there was this foxhound. It came into the garden and sat down. It was in an advanced state of starvation and so covered with ticks that it took two hours to get them off. The poor animal had hardly any blood left in him, and had to be taken to the vet for transfusions. When I returned from New York, he was quite restored and full of beans. We can't imagine where he came from, but he is a beautiful dog, and I suppose must have strayed. He had evidently been wandering in the woods for days, getting nothing to eat and accumulating ticks. Then one night we heard something crying in the dark. And there was a tiny white kitten. This was added to the strength. About a week after that, I was walking to get the mail when I saw a car ahead of me suddenly swerve, and it seemed to me that there was a small dark object in the middle of the road. It was a black kitten. I picked it up and put it on my shoulder, and it sang to me all the way to the post office and back, shoving its nose against my face. It too was added to the menagerie and christened Puna. After that, we were hourly expecting more cats and dogs to arrive, and were not disappointed. The final score was two dogs and seven cats. The bright side is that all our animals get along together like sailors on shore leave. But I sometimes wish our cats had not acquired the habit of jumping up on my lap and demanding attention. When I'm seated at the typewriter in an agony of creative composition, not that I haven't succeeded in working under much more testing conditions than are created by a cat on the lap. My book, Money in the Bank, J.P., is the only novel I should imagine that was ever written in an internment camp. I did it at the rate of about a page a day in a room with over fifty men playing cards and ping pong, and talking and singing. The first twelve chapters were written in a whirl of ping pong balls. I suppose on an average morning I would get from fifteen to twenty on the side of the head, just as I was searching for the mot juste. The internment camp was a toast in Upper Silesia, and the final stage of a period of confinement which began when I was rounded up by the German occupation forces at Le Touquet. The German soldiers who looked after us were mostly elderly reservists. Longing to get home to their wives and children, whose photographs they constantly showed us, and they sympathised with us. There was one particularly genial sergeant, whose only fault was that he got entirely the wrong angle on the damned parade they compelled us to take part in. He wanted us to go through the motions smartly, with lots of snap. Come on, boys! He seemed to be saying. Get the carnival spirit. Switch on the charm. Give us the old personality. He actually suggested one day that we should come on parade at the double. When we were convinced that we had really heard what we thought we had heard, we looked at one another with raised eyebrows and asked one of the soldiers to explain to this visionary. That in order to attend parade, we had to climb twenty-seven steep stone steps. It was unreasonable, we felt, to expect us to behave like mountain goats on a diet of biscuits about the size of aspirin tablets, and one small mug of thin soup a day. Try to make him understand, we urged the soldier, that it is pretty dashed creditable of us getting on parade at all. We are elderly internees, most of us with corns and swollen joints. 
not alpine climbers. Many of our German guards were simply baffled as to who on earth we were and how we came to be interned. I'm bound to say the whole thing puzzled me a bit, too. Why on earth Germany should have thought it worthwhile to round up and corral a bunch of spavined old deadbeats like myself and the rest of us, it was beyond me to imagine. Silly horseplay was the way I looked at it. The idea was, I suppose, that if left at large, we would have gone about selling the plans of forts. But one would have thought that a single glance at me would have been enough to tell them that if somebody had handed me a fort on a plate with watercress round it, I wouldn't have known what to do with it. I wouldn't even have known what price to charge. And now about those famous, or as some thought them, infamous broadcasts of mine from Germany. The same broadcasts which I was amused after the war to learn were used by the American War Department at its intelligence school at Camp Ritchie as models of anti-Nazi propaganda for the instruction of the lads they were teaching how to do it. I also learned later that the late Air Marshal Boyd of the RAF, who, unlike some of the critics, actually heard the broadcasts, swore that the Nazi authorities would never let me stay alive after pulling their legs so devastatingly. There is, said the air marshal, some stuff about being packed in cattle trucks and a thing about Lou's jail that you would think would send a Hun crazy. Woodhouse has probably been shot by now. Some of the charges made against me at the time of the broadcast were, of course, quite true. W. D. Connor, for instance, in his article in the Daily Mirror and subsequent speech on the BBC, accused me, not mincing his words, of having the Christian names of Pelham Grenville. And he was perfectly right. In the year 1881, I was christened Pelham Grenville, after a godfather, and not a thing to show for it except a small silver mug. I remember protesting at the time, vigorously, but it did no good. The clergyman stuck to his point. Be that as it may, he said firmly, having waited for a lull, I name thee Pelham Grenville. All I could do was to express my regrets to Mr. Connor, coupled with the hope that his Christian names were Valpurgis Diamid, or something of that sort, and that some day he would have to admit this in public. With Sean O'Casey's statement that I am English literature's performing flea, I scarcely know how to deal. Thinking it over, I believe he meant to be complimentary, for all the performing fleas I have met have impressed me with their sterling artistry and that indefinable something which makes the good trooper. But, J.P., to switch from the kind of thing I write to the kind of thing I read, I have always been a great reader of mystery stories, or novels of suspense, as they've come to be called. One of the strong views I hold on such works is that the insertion into them of a love interest is a serious mistake. But the boys all seem to be doing that now. They aren't content with letting their detective detect. They will have him playing emotional scenes with the heroine. Nobody appreciates more than myself the presence of girls in their proper place. In the paddock at Ascot, fine. 
at Lord's during the luncheon interval at the Eton and Harrow match. Capital. If I went to a nightclub and found no girls there, I should be the first to complain. But what I do say is that you don't want them in Lasker Joe's underground den at Limehouse on a busy evening. Apart from anything else, woman seems to me to lose her queenly dignity when she's being shoved into a cupboard with a bag over her head. And if there's one thing certain, it is that sooner or later something of that sort will be happening to the heroine of a novel of suspense. For, though beautiful, with large grey eyes and hair the colour of ripe corn, the heroine of a novel of suspense is almost never a very intelligent girl. Indeed, it would scarcely be overstating it to say that her mentality is that of a retarded child of six. She may have escaped death a dozen times. She may know perfectly well that the Blackbird gang is after her to secure the papers. The police may have warned her on no account to stir outside her house. But when a messenger calls at half-past two in the morning with an unsigned note that says, Come at once. She just reaches for her hat and goes. What we all liked so much about Sherlock Holmes was his correct attitude in this matter of girls. True, he would sometimes permit them to call at Baker Street and tell him about the odd behaviour of their uncles or stepfathers. In a pinch, he might even allow them to marry Watson. But once the story was under way, they had to retire to the background and stay there. That was the spirit. The annoying thing is that the character whom we ought to be able to trust to rid us of these pests, the villain or the heavy, so often makes a mess of it. Experience has taught us that we cannot rely on this man. He had let us down too often and forfeited our confidence. The trouble with the heavy in a novel of suspense is that he suffers from a fatal excess of ingenuity. When he was a boy, his parents must thoughtlessly have told him he was clever, and it has absolutely spoiled him for effective work. The ordinary man, when circumstances compel him to murder a female acquaintance, borrows a revolver and a few cartridges and does the job in some odd five minutes of the day when he's not at the office. He does not bother about art or technique or scientific methods. He just goes and does it. But the heavy cannot understand simplicity. It never occurs to him just to point a pistol at the heroine and fire it. If you told him that the thing could be done that way, he would suspect you of pulling his leg. The only method he can imagine is to tie her to a chair, erect a tripod, place the revolver on it, tie a string to the trigger, pass the string along the wall till it rests on a hook, attach another string to it, pass this over a hook, tie a brick to the second string and light a candle under it. He's got the thing reasoned out. The candle will burn the second string, the brick will fall, the weight will tighten the first string, thus pulling the trigger, and there you are. And then, of course, somebody comes along and blows the candle out, and all the weary work to do over again. As I see it, the average heavy's natural impulse, if called upon to kill a fly, would be to saw through the supports of the floor, tie a string across the doorway, and then send the fly an anonymous letter telling it to come at once in order to hear of something to its advantage. The idea being that it would hurry to the room, trip over the string, fall through the floor, and break its neck. This, to the heavy's mind, is not merely the simplest, it is the only way of killing flies. You could talk to him till you were hoarse, but you would never convince him that better results can be obtained through the medium of a rolled-up morning paper gripped by the football coupon. I have known a heavy to sift the heroine on a keg of gunpowder and expect it to be struck by lightning. <laughs> you can't run a business that way. Of course, I'm not reading novels of suspense all the time, J.P. I like now and again to switch from gore to guffaw. <laughs> I like a good laugh as well as the next man. But where do you get it in these days? Humorists are often rather gloomy men, and what makes them so is the sense they have of being apart from the herd, 
of being, as one might say, the eczema on the body politic. They are looked down upon by the intelligentsia, patronized by the critics, and generally regarded as outside the pale of literature. People are very serious today, and the writer who does not take them seriously is viewed with concern and suspicion. Fiddle while Rome burns, would you? they say to him, and treat him as an outcast. I think we should all be sorry for humorists and try to be very kind to them, for they are so vulnerable. You can blot the sunshine from their lives in an instant by telling them you don't see what's so funny in that. And if there is something funny in it, you can take all the heart out of them by calling them facetious or describing them as mere humorists. A humorist who has been called mere not only winces, he frets. He refuses to eat his cereal. He goes about with his hands in his pockets and his lower lip jutting out, kicking stones and telling himself that the lot of a humorist is something that ought not to happen to a dog. <laughs> Ask about my regimen for health, J.P. Well, I make a practice of smoking all day and far into the night. Smoking, as everybody knows, toughens and fortifies the system. Tolstoy said it didn't, but I shall be dealing with Tolstoy in a moment and putting him in his place. It can scarcely have escaped the notice of thinking men, I imagine, that the forces of darkness opposed to those of us who like the quiet smoke are gathering momentum daily and starting to throw their weight about more than somewhat. Each morning I read in the papers a long article by another of those doctors who are the spearhead of the movement. Tobacco, they say, hardens the arteries and lowers the temperature of the body extremities. And if you reply that you like your arteries hard and are all for having the temperature of your body extremities lowered, especially in the summer months, they bring up that cat again, the one that has two drops of nicotine placed on its tongue and instantly passes beyond the veil. Look, they say, I place two drops of nicotine on the tongue of this cat. Now watch it wilt. I can't see the argument. Must we deprive ourselves of all our modest pleasures just because indulgence in them would be harmful to some cat, which is probably a perfect stranger, to me and to you too, probably, J.P.? It is pitiful to think that that is how these doctors spend their lives, placing drops of nicotine on the tongues of cats day in, day out, all year round, except possibly on bank holidays. But if you tell them that they have become slaves to a habit and urge them to summon up their manhood and throw off the shackles, they just stare at you with fishy eyes and mumble that it can't be done. Of course it can be done. If they were to say to themselves, I will not start placing nicotine on cats' tongues till after lunch, they would have made a beginning. After that it would be simple to knock off during the afternoon and by degrees they would find that they could abstain altogether. The first cat of the day is the hard one to give up. Conquer the impulse for the after-breakfast cat, and the battle is half won. But now, the bird I am resolved to expose before the bar of world opinion is the late Count Leo N. Tolstoy. For one reason or another, I have not read Tolstoy in the original Russian, it is possible that a faulty translation may have misled me, 
But what he is recorded as saying in his essays, letters and miscellanies is that an excellent substitute for smoking may be found in twirling the fingers. And there rises before one's mental eye the picture of some big public dinner. Decorations will be worn. At the moment when the toast of the Queen is being drunk. The Queen! The Queen! God bless her! And then, gentlemen, you may twirl your fingers. It wouldn't work! there would be a sense of something missing. You ask me, J.P., for my views on television. Well, I have a set, but I very seldom switch it on. When some Friday night there's a big fight on, you'll always find me at the ringside encouraging Sugar Ray Robinson or Carmen Basilio or whoever it may be with word and gesture. But apart from that, television scarcely enters my life. I sometimes think, looking back to the time when I was a viewer, that I could have endured television with more fortitude if they had not laughed so much all the time. The laughter of studio audiences seems to be governed by some code of rules, probably unwritten and conveyed by word of mouth, for it is surely straining the probabilities a good deal to assume that a studio audience can read. But there is a fine spirit stirring in America these days, I'm glad to say. The people are on the march. The other day, someone whipped out a revolver and shot his television set. And a week or so ago, there was a still more impressive demonstration. Folks, let me lead by the hand into the Hall of Fame, Richard Wilton. At 1.30 in the afternoon of what will no doubt be known as Wilton's Day, and celebrated as a national festival, Richard Wilton, 29, of 103 Baker Avenue, Brooklyn, entered the studio of the Columbia Broadcasting Company during the rehearsal of a television show, armed with an eight-inch carving knife. I hate all television, he announced. I hate commentators. I hate the whole lousy bunch. There ought to be a law against television. I want to kill a TV operator. Having spoken these words, which must have touched a responsive chord in many a bosom, this splendid fellow proceeded to stab a cameraman and to hit the producer on the frontal bone with a carafe. And, lest you purse your lips at the latter statement, saying to yourselves, Hello, what's this? Did Wilton weaken? I must explain that a carafe picked up on the set was all he had to work with. After he stabbed the cameraman, the knife broke. He had paid only 59 cents for it, not reflecting that you cannot get a really good carving knife as cheap as that. If you're going to stab cameramen, it's always wise to go as high as a dollar. It was as he was about to attack the director that the police came in and scooped him up, a sad disappointment to the better element. It appears that there is some law against wiping out television directors with carafes, one of those strange laws that get passed occasionally and nobody knows why. Where Richard went wrong, in my opinion, was in confining his activities to a rehearsal, for by doing so he missed the studio audience. He should have bided his time till one of these gangs had been assembled. Where everything about television is so frightful, it is difficult to say which is its most repulsive feature. But the majority of connoisseurs would, I think, pick the studio audience. If it would only stay quiet, nobody would have any complaint. But it won't. It laughs like a congregation of hyenas at everything. The other night, on what was for some reason described as a comedy program, a girl said to a man, you are selfish. To which he replied, How dare you call me a shellfish? The studio audience let out a bellow of mirth which was audible as far downtown as the battery, and all over America strong men gritted their teeth and murmured, Wilton, thou shouldst be living at this hour. But a time will come. In ninety days, or whatever it is, he will be with us once more. Good hunting, Richard Wilton, and don't make that mistake again of trying to do it on the cheap. Avoid bargain prices. 
Even if it costs as much as two dollars, get a good knife. But, J.P., to conclude, when I first came to New York, everyone was gay and light-hearted. Each morning and evening paper had its team of humorists turning out daily masterpieces in prose and verse. Magazines published funny short stories. Publishers humorous books. It was the golden age. And I think it ought to be brought back. I want to see an A.P. Herbert on every street corner. It needs only a little resolution on the part of the young writers and a touch of the old broad-mindedness among editors. And if any young writer with a gift for being funny has got the idea that there is something undignified and antisocial about making people laugh, let him read this from the Talmud, a book which, one may remind him, was written in an age just as grim as this one. And Elijah said to Baroka, these two will also share in the world to come. Baroka then asked them, What is your occupation? They replied, We are merrymakers. When we see a person who is downhearted, we cheer him up. These two were among the very select few who would inherit the kingdom of heaven. But now, J.P., it's back to the workbench. Dusk had fallen once more on Blanding's castle. Chauffeur Vools was playing his harmonica. The stable cat was having a quick wash and brush up before starting on its night out. And in the kitchen, Mrs. Willoughby, the cook, was putting the final touches on the well-jammed roly-poly pudding, which Beach would soon be taking to the library. Through the open window, the scent of stocks and tobacco plant floated in, competing with the aroma of the leg of lamb, the boiled potatoes, and the spinach with which dinner had begun. Beach brought in the roly-poly pudding and withdrew, and Lord Emsworth heaved a contented sigh. In Lady Constance's time it would have made his stiff shirt front go pop, but now it merely stirred the bosom of his shooting coat with the holes in the elbows. His toes wriggled sensuously inside his bedroom slippers. You've been listening to Michael Redgrave in Performing Flea, compiled by Sam Pollock from the autobiographical writings of P.G. Woodhouse. Martin Jarvis was the narrator, and the program was produced by Alan Haydock.